So, um, so I'm not going to talk about, <laughs> uh, neither in French nor in English, uh, about optical application, but about this uh, subject that is more uh, of an uh, OB than, uh, than uh, um, the mainstream of my research. Um, uh, it's about uh, time buying media, so wave propagation, and, and I will talk also about stabilization of, the, of this kind of media. And it's a, it's a grow, growing field uh, that uh, started uh, uh, with um, uh, Frank Wilshake uh, uh, article in uh, uh, 2013 uh, about uh, uh, how to break the time symmetry uh, in, a, in a medium uh, and what would be the consequence of this. And we end up doing this kind of, uh, of research uh, by uh, uh, um, a way that is, was not obvious. And I'm going to talk about this, uh, this, uh, this story about how we, we end up doing some time buying media. So I will begin uh, by presenting the team, uh, meaning the, all the people that uh, did the, uh, the experiments and the series that uh, I will present. So you know a few of them, of course, so Yves Couder uh, and uh, Matthias Fink, and all the students that now are, uh, uh, most of, for most of them, uh, uh, permanent researcher or professor in different institutions. So, um, so let me go back to a long time ago uh, with the first experiment that we did with, uh, with Yves. We were teaching together at uh, FIEX in Paris uh, 7, uh, Paris Diderot. Now it's uh, Paris Cité. Cité. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we end up finding this, um, this um, doing this discovery about uh, non-coalescence of, of a droplet on a bouncing system. So the bass is just uh, excited vertically at about 50 hertz, and the little droplet that you see here is the same liquid as the bass. Uh, and it, it bounces like that uh, without coalescing uh, for uh, um, forever. Uh, uh, so the droplet is about one millimeter, and uh, and as you can see, um, it, it tries to, to to compress the air layer between the droplet and the bass, but then it has to be lift off again, and so uh, it stays like that. And so this discovery uh, was um, uh, followed. Uh, about one year later, we, uh, we observed something else uh, with these, the same droplets. Uh, and this is the top view in real time of the basque, which uh, and the basque is about 10 centimeters in size. And you see this little droplet that is bouncing and that is now self-propelled. So for certain condition, this uh, droplet becomes self-propelled on the bass, and you can see uh, the waves are a bit strange, and you see it's strobed at the uh, with a, um, uh, and are oscillating in a strange way, and I'm going to talk about, uh, about this uh, later. Uh, so with this droplet, with this uh, uh, bouncing droplet, self propelled droplet, um, we, we did many experiments, and I'm not going to go into the detail, I just want to go uh, uh, directly to, to my point of time buying media, but we did many experiments because this droplet has a kind of, it's a kind of source uh, dressed by the wave it emits around, and so it has a, um, a, class a classical wave particle duality. Uh, nothing is uh, 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 no link with quantum uh, duality, uh, but we can play with it. We can understand how it works, and we can do experiments that are analogous to the quantum experiment. So let me just show you very quickly, without commenting the two uh, very nice experiments, where you see that the droplets are, are doing quantized orbits, okay, uh, interacting uh, through their wave field. And the other experiment that you all know in quantum physics, it's a two-slit experiment with a single particle. And you see, so you send droplets uh, in, the, in the slit and you look at the, the deviation. And uh, what you end up finding is, uh, is that uh, indeed, uh, there is a difference if there is another slit uh, or not. Uh, this is due to the fact that you can understand it uh, uh, classically that the droplet is just filling the, the, the environment through the wave it emits. And so it knows even if it does not go through the other slit that there is a slit because it interferes with its own behavior. 
so I'm not going to talk about that, but we are in a time varying media because we are exciting the medium. And I want to, to go into the detail of, of the wave field that is produced by this source. So you see here, it's a, a, a slow motion of this droplet, and uh, you see that it's, it's bouncing on a wave field that is very strange. It is modulated, and it, it seems like it's uh, uh, stationary. So it's not propagating outwards. And so this is a very strange uh, wave field. And to understand this wave field, we must relate it to a phenomenon that happens on, on, on um, uh, ba excited bath, uh, which is called the Faraday instability. So it's a parametric excitation. So if you excite a bath uh, and uh, at a certain frequency, you end up finding that uh, there is an instability that appears above a certain threshold. And uh, you see at half the frequency, some waves, standing wave appearing on the bath. And so with our droplet, we are just very close to this instability, but not above. Otherwise, uh, the, the, the bath would be covered by the wave uh, of this instability. And this is a general case of instability. If you're very close to an instability and you try to excite uh, the, the instability, then you end up uh, having some excitation that is dependent on the distance to the threshold. So here is a very simple experiment that, uh, that tells you how we excite the Faraday instability with the droplet. And we did it with a, a very small steel ball. And so we drop the steel ball in the bath. And this is what you end up finding if you just throw a stone in a, in a bath, uh, in a pond. Uh, you have a, a wave, a gravitocapillary wave, that is propagating outwards uh, from uh, the, the position of the, of the, the bond. Here, it's, if you do exactly the same experiment, but now you excite the bath. So you see the same wave is propagating outwards, but you have something left in the, just uh, below the, the droplet or the, the bead. Uh, and this wave uh, is at the Faraday uh, wavelength, at the Faraday frequency, and it's a standing wave. And this wave remains here for a time that depends on the distance to the threshold. So if you were just near the threshold, you would have this wave standing there for uh, uh, forever. So here is a spatiotemporal uh, graph of this, uh, of this bead falling into the bath. So you see you have a kind of light cone that is emitted. And on the time scale, you see that these waves are standing wave, standing wave with a, a damping that is again dependent on the distance to the threshold. So when we saw that with Eve, we have a lot of discussion about that. Uh, it's very strange because if you think about a standing wave, a standing wave, normally you would say, okay, there's a divergent wave that it would be the retarded solution, but the convergent waves that make this standing wave is normally associated to uh, the advanced solution when you try to find the solution. So we were like that, uh, wondering uh, this, about this, um, this standing wave and this kind of uh, advanced wave that was coming uh, uh, from, I mean, the, the excitation of the bass. And then we discussed with, uh, with Matthias Fink. When you talk with Matthias Fink, he's always thinking about time reversal. So he said, in, in fact, when you say advanced wave, it's an advanced wave. <laughs> so it looks like you're doing time reversal. So you have a wave going backwards, and because of the Faraday instability, you're producing a wave that is coming back to the source. So this is exactly the definition of a time reversal. So let's try to do an experiment. Let's try, instead of having a sinusoidal shaking, let's have a pulse shaking. So you are, we sent a wave, we have a pulse, and let's see if the wave is coming back to the source. So we did this experiment with uh, Vincent Bacot during his PhD, and uh, Mathieu Labousse, who did the, um, the theory about that. Um, so let's look at what's, what's going on. So here we blow on the bath, you see from the side. We blow some air, which is now the source, and now suddenly we shake the bath. And as you can see here at the center, some waves are coming back to the source. 
Then, because there's no source anymore, then they are crossing and they are going uh, diverging again. Of course, it's an experiment, so when you do this, it's about uh, uh, 20g in acceleration for the bath, so you see all the wave coming from the boundary that you want to, to avoid, in fact. So when you do now a profile of the waves that are emitted, then you see really well that it's a time reversal wave. So uh, this is an exper the experiment that you just saw. So we call it instant instantaneous time mirror. And suddenly when you shake it, you see that you produce a backward wave that is a time reversed wave. So the, the, the larger wavelengths are going back first. It's not just a, 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 a space reversal. And so if you have uh, dispersion, you will uh, compensate for the dispersion and you will, uh, you will uh, refocus completely uh, the wavelengths at, uh, at the source. So in fact, uh, what we are doing is, is real time reversal. Uh, how to explain this? Uh, we can explain it very simply by, by just taking the wave equation. So the wave equation is uh, the D'Alembert wave equ equation, the standard one. And if you take the Cauchy theorem, it tells you that uh, if you know the wave field and the derivative the, uh, in time of the wave field, you know the initial condition and then you can, uh, you can know what's going on with, to the, with this field. And if you want to do a time reversal, it's like reversing for a particle the velocity. You just have to reverse uh, the, the time derivative of the wave field. So if you put a minus in front of the time derivative of the wave field, then you produce a time reverse wave. So how to do that? Uh, you need another ingredient with wave, which is called the superposition principle. So if you, for instance, you begin with a, a wave field where you have no derivative in time, just a wave field, so a perturbation of the, of the surface of the bath, or, or any wave, by, it could be optical wave or acoustic wave, uh, then you can always write this uh, perturbation of the field into two terms, two propagating, contra-propagating terms. One will be uh, forward propagating and one will be backward propagating. So this means that if you can, in fact, change the relation between the wave field and its time derivative, put to zero, for instance, then what you will produce by the superposition principle, you will produce two wave fields, one going forward in time and one going backward to the source. So uh, in our case, what, what we are doing is a bit different, a bit more complex, but slightly more complex. In fact, when you shake the bath, what you do is you just change the velocity of the wave that are propagating in the bath. So here you take the equation and you change the, uh, the refractive index, the equivalent of refractive index, and you modify it in time. And the, the simplest way to produce the perturbation of this is you see you put a Dirac at the time of the, of the perturbation. And what you create at the time of the perturbation, you create a source in the, in the, in the, which is, uh, which is uh, in, wait, let me show you this. Uh, which is this part, okay, we create a source in the, the second term here, uh, that is, in fact, uh, uh, the second derivative of the wave field. Okay, so it's not exactly the wave field, it's the second derivative, but basically it looks like the wave field. Okay, and when you do this, when you add these sources, what you end up with is uh, the initial condition was this, now you add this term, okay, and what you create, you still have the same propagating wave, and you create two waves. One is going forward, one is going backward. And this time is the, the time reversed uh, waves that you produced. So you see it's not exactly the time reversed uh, wave. It's the time reverse of the derivative of the wave field. But you know if you are like uh, in a sinusoidal wave or, uh, or the bandwidth is, uh, is uh, narrow, it's uh, to a phase, it's uh, pretty equivalent to the wave field. That's why it re resembles very much of the wave field. So this is how, in fact, by just varying the velocity, you produce a, a time reverse wave. Um, let's, let's talk about... Uh, uh, it, it's not very intuitive to do uh, uh, like a, a time mirror. So l let's see it uh, compared with a normal mirror. So in a normal mirror, you have a source A, okay, uh, and you have the mirror, and you have a virtual source on the other side. 
And when you, you, you do the, the, the ray tracing, in fact, you put some arrow, and the arrow can go to the, from the left to the right, or from the right to the left, because uh, this 2D is X and Y, and there's no time in this, in this, um, in this plane. Okay, so the time can go uh, on the left or on the right. But now, if you do the same thing with the time mirror, now the X axis is time. So you cannot, in fact, put some arrow backwards in this direction. So now all the arrows that are created at the time of the, uh, the time boundary, at the, the time mirror, are just refocusing uh, to a, a real uh, image uh, in time. And this is exactly what we see. If I take a, a profile of the, the field that is emitted, you see that uh, it's going outwards, and then su suddenly, at the time mirror, you have uh, the wave field that is refocusing exactly at the same time. And you see, by the way, the dispersion is cancelled as it, it refocuses. So, of course, you can do this with a single point source, but you can also do it uh, with a more complex source, like a smiley. So here you have a smiley that is uh, uh, produced on the, on the bat. It's a bit dark, sorry. But you see, smiley is coming back again. So what you, we do is we, we have some, some, uh, some sources, then we remove this to be able to see the waves. And I can tell you now we are doing a pulse, and you have all the wave coming back to the source. OK, so this is uh, an example of, of time reversal with wave. Uh, we can go a bit further. So this was with a pulse, but now we can go back to a sinusoidal excitation, as in the case of a droplet. Okay. So in this case, time reversal in optics is called uh, phase conjugation. Donc, uh, so here we have a phase conjugated mirror if we do the same thing, but we excite uh, uh, with a sinusoidal excitation. So as you all know, uh, uh, the principle of phase uh, conjugate mirror uh, is uh, instead of a standard mirror on the, on the top uh, drawing, uh, is refocusing on, on, the, on the source. So you have a, a, a phase conjugated wave that is refocusing on the source, and this is used, for instance, if you go through a, a complex disordered medium, okay, with this kind of mirror, what you do is uh, you can sell the, the, so you reverse uh, the, the wave front, and you can sell the, the aberration of, of, the, of the medium. So how could we do that uh, with a um, wave, a water wave? Yes. The only problem is if you shake the whole bath, you have this everywhere. So if you want to produce a, a, a phase conjugated mirror in a, a, a place of the bath, then you need to play tricks. Uh, the trick is uh, that the Faraday instability is, uh, the, the threshold for the Faraday instability is higher in deep water. So the idea is that in deep water, so you split your bath into two, in deep water you will have the Faraday instability that will make the phase conjugated mirror. But in shallow water, then it's like if you were not shaking the bath. Let's look at what's going on here. So for, for me, if, if, um, as an optician, uh, I have never seen what's going on in a, a non-linear optical uh, uh, device that is uh, doing a, a phase conjugate mirror. And here you will see it. So look, let's, let's observe this. Uh, sorry. Up. Up. So here you have a source that is in the shallow part. So we blow some, uh, with the source some air. And here you have the phase conjugate mirror. So here it's off, so nothing happened. Okay. Now we turn on the system, we remove the background, and let's see what's going on. So we shake the bath now, and we see how the, the waves are reflected by the phase conjugated mirror. So you see now that the phase conjugated mirror refocuses the, the, the wave onto the source, as expected from our phase conjugate mirror. We can do better, we can do shape of France, okay? Not that there is no Corsica, um, uh, but it was done much before the, <laughs> uh, the, the current issue. Uh, so here France is shallow water, and it's surrounded 
by phase conjugate mirror. So if I excite any city in France and then I stop, then I've got refocusing at each position, whatever the position is in, in France, because this time uh, conjugate mirror, the, the, the shape of the, the mirror has no importance for refocusing. So let's go back to this little droplet that we saw at the beginning. So this is a, um, a droplet that is bouncing and is going to the right. And you, will, you see it will uh, be destroyed, it will die on, on this little bubble that will kill the droplet. And here what's happened? So here you see that now we can interpret this droplet, this bouncing droplet, as a source that is surrounded by a kind of time cavity. It's surrounded by a Bragg time mirror that maintains these waves around the, around the source. So this is another way of, of looking at this droplet. You see it as a, as a source surrounding by a time cavity. Um, if this is the case, you can do more complex system. For instance, it will evolve in a time cavity and the droplet, will, if there is noise, for instance, will do some strange motion due to the noise uh, and the time cavity will, will send back some waves. And one very nice example is the following. We did this experiment uh, uh, last year uh, with Samuel Bernardet. Um, and uh, you see this is a real uh, picture of the wave field. The colors are not artificial, they are projected on the, on the bus. And here you see that, in fact, it's rotating. There is no external force. It's just rotating uh, with the wave it produced in this cavity, in this time cavity. Uh, we accelerate a little bit. But you, what you are doing here is you are building a spin state, it is stable, due to the, the waves that are coming back uh, uh, to, the, to the source. So this is this kind of stuff that you can do with uh, playing with time cavities. Um, now, um, what we did till now was either a sinusoidal excitation, that's a modulation of the refractive index uh, in time, the sinusoidal modulation, or a pulse, a Dirac time kind of uh, excitation. But what we can see is what is an Eviside, which is a very simple uh, uh, interface. So for a space interface, you all know what's going on. Uh, I take the wave propagation, the D'Alembert equation, and you define it be, uh, at for x negative and for x positive. And what you do is you change the wave vector, and you, does, you do not change the frequency, of course. So the energy is conserved, but not the momentum. With the time, interface, so what, your, what is the time interface? The time interface is you're propagating in a medium and suddenly you change in the whole medium the refractive index. So suddenly, for instance, for in optics, you would, trans, uh, you, you would go from air to, to glass. Okay? So suddenly you do this and what's going to happen? The wave, uh, the wave vector will not change this time, okay? but, uh, but the energy will change. So what you're doing is you're changing the way time is, uh, uh, is evolving. That's what you're doing. Uh, so in this case, the momentum is conserved okay, by symmetry, but not the energy. So if the energy is not conserved, then you can also produce some energy. That, okay, there's no, no problem because you inject energy by doing this. So, so, but you can increase the size of uh, the energy of the wave. So let's look how it works. Uh, we did this in, in water waves. And you see with shaking, it's a bit difficult to maintain <laughs> a constant higher acceleration. <laughs> it would mean that your whole system is, going, <laughs> is falling or something like that. So here we, we did uh, another experiment. We used electrostriction. So electrostriction is you, we put an electrode on the top of the, of the conducting uh, water. Uh, and with this, you add with a potential, an electrical potential, you do, you do change the, the velocity of the wave. And this can be controlled, this can be controlled in space, in time, uh, what, uh, and you can do it quickly compared to the propagation of the wave. So here you see an experiment that is measuring, so here's the electrode, uh, you have a shaker, you producing a wave, and when the wave is going under the electrode, uh, sorry, on the top, uh, then you change, uh, you change the, the wavelengths. Uh, by the way, uh, this is a very interesting way to 
uh, to have a refraction-based control of water wave. Uh, water waves are, are, are funny because we, when we talk about waves, we all think about water waves because these are the ones that we can see, uh, but they are very difficult to control. And for instance, there is no refractive way to control them, so no lens, no stuff like that, uh, no glass. Uh, and with this, you can produce all the, the sort of, of refractive uh, uh, device that you have, for instance, in optics. So you have uh, tunable lenses, you can have a, a waveguide, you can have a, a total internal reflection or, or semi-reflecting uh, cubes and stuff like that. And you can do interferometry, etc. Uh, this, this is uh, the internship of, uh, of uh, Valentin Mouet. Okay, so let's observe what we, we get. So you're, we're going from the left. So this is a reference on the bottom. On the top, you see the, the shaded area is the electrode. So you see here clearly the change of, of wavelengths as you go down in the electrode. So when you do that, you can represent it, the wavefront, uh, the evolution of the wavefront in time and space. And you see that at a vertical uh, interface, space interface, uh, the, the wave uh, vector is changing, but the frequency is still the same. So basically, if you look at the dispersion relation, you go from uh, medium one to medium two in an horizontal manner. Now, if you want to do a, a time interface, so an EVISA time of interface, what you do is you just wait that the wave are below the electrode and suddenly change uh, the, the refractive index. This is what you obtain. So now the electrode is off. This is a reference, and this is what you are going to see here. We turn on the, the electrode, and what you see, it's going faster, but the wavelength is the same. And when you do the analysis here, so now it's an horizontal uh, boundary, and you see the, the wavefront are, are, are changed by this boundary, when you look at the wave vector, it does not change. When you look at the frequency, it does change. And so what you're doing in the dispersion curve is you're changing in a, a, vertical, uh, a vertical transition, going from medium two to medium one, for instance, in this case. So you see with this, what you can do is, in fact, uh, start from medium one, and after a space and time uh, boundary, uh, you can go back to medium one and you have changed the frequency. And this is what we're going to, to do. Um, usually, for frequency conversion, uh, the, the two main ways to do frequency conversion is nonlinear optics, or nonlinear system, or Doppler effect. Okay. Here, you have a linear way to do that. You can change with a linear system uh, uh, the, the frequency. So how do you do that? You do just a space and time transition. Let's do it experimentally. By the way, this is very difficult to do in optics, for instance. You can imagine that changing uh, the, the, way, the, the refractive index suddenly is not so easy. So you enter in the space, and then suddenly you turn off the, you turn off the electrode, and then you have changed. When you do the analysis, you have changed both space and time, uh, sorry, the uh, wave vector and frequency. And what you have done is you have taken your wave packet and changed it in a linear manner uh, along the, uh, the dispersion curve. Which is, uh, if you look more in detail about this, this phenomena, you know there is a kind of, uh, you can define some kind of Fresnel reflection in space and time, of course. And the, 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 the way um, the energy is transmitted, it will depend on the impedance of uh, these uh, interfaces. But you end up doing, when you do the calculation, finding that if you do the same kind of space and time uh, 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 interface, you end up finding that all your energy is converted into uh, the, the other frequency. So basically, if you had some a certain number of photon, for instance, uh, at a given energy, you will find out that all your photon has changed their energy into uh, the, other, uh, the other medium. So it's, a, I would say, like a 100% conversion efficiency. What you can do is you can, uh, because it's non-commutative, you can uh, do a, a cascade of this, so with many, and you can do a blue shift, for instance, ca cascade. So here you turn off all the electrode as it goes down, 
and you see that the wavelength is changing and it blue shifts your signal. Of course, you can do the opposite by just changing uh, the commutativity of the two. So now they are off, you enter, and then you go down. Frequency is going down and then it's being redshift. Okay, you can do the measurement and you redshift uh, as long as you want. Okay, so with this, by little step, you can go from uh, very low frequency to very high frequency with 100% uh, efficiency. So I would dream to do this in optics, but I don't know how to do this. Okay. Um, so in the second part of my talk, I will talk about, uh, about the stabilization by vibration. Uh, so again, this is a, module, uh, a time modulation of a medium, but it's a bit different. So uh, maybe the link between the two is not so obvious, but uh, you will see uh, it's, a, it's a funny experiment that we, we did with, with the students uh, uh, after a talk that I um, attended. Uh, where it was, uh, it was dealing with uh, the Kapitza pendulum. So Kapitza pendulum, if, if you take a pendulum and you excite it vertically, okay, not at resonance, uh, the frequency can be whatever frequency you want, uh, but uh, fast compared to the natural uh, frequency of the pendulum. Uh, here what's going on is you stabilized the equilibrium that is upside down as you can see here. So how do you explain that? It's very simple to explain. Uh, it was explained by Capitza. Uh, so if you look at uh, the, in the lab frame, you have this, uh, this pendulum that is doing uh, this, uh, this motion. But now if you look in the, the, the pendulum uh, frame, then you see here the two forces, F1 and F2, uh, the momentum associated to the two forces are different because the, the angle is different, so the projection is different. So at the end, during this uh, sinusoidal uh, modulation, what's going on? When you integrate over the whole modulation, what you end up is an average force, an average torque that is going to push it upwards. Um, so here is the torque that if you do the calculation that you get, and of course you have another torque that is due to gravity. If you have a torque that is, uh, so um, a dynamic torque that is higher than the, the gravity torque, then you have, st you have stabilized the system. And what you end up with is you need to shake with a velocity that is uh, above a certain threshold, which is a, a square root of 2g, for instance, in the case of the pendulum. So the question was, can we do it the same with water? Can we use this to stabilize water upside down? That was my question when I ended up uh, after this talk. Um, in fact, if you look at a, a layer of liquid or an upside down liquid, and you take a portion of this liquid, what he wants to do, he wants to be destabilized, okay? So he wants to go down and to, uh, and to, to do what is called the Rayleigh-Taylor instability. But if you look at this, there is a rotating point for e everywhere on this, uh, on this layer. And associated to this waiting, uh, these uh, rotating points, there are a mass of liquids that want to rotate. So this is an inverted pendulum. Just the fact that the mass is different, so the size is different, and they are all these size, you need, if you want to stabilize the whole layer, to stabilize all the possibilities, okay? So you need to stabilize all these inverted pendulum with different characteristics in order to stabilize the, the layer. So can we do that? Yes. Uh, so this is another approach that you can, if you want to do the calculation, uh, in fact, uh, this is just the, the wave propagation on the top of the, of the liquid layer, and you have the dispersion relation that you get with, uh, with uh, water wave. So the first part is GK is gravity part, and the other part in K3 is the capillary part. So if I look at the stability of this, so omega square, as compared with the K, I see that of course, everything is stable here. Everything is positive. The, the omega-2 is positive. And all these waves are, of course, stable if I'm not upside down. Now, if I 
exchange this for an upside down position. What is changing here is just I've got a minus in front of the G here. So now the curve is the following. So at high K, where I've got a capillary wave, it's still stable. So this means that if I want to put upside down a small quantity of water, then it's stable. But at small k, so high wavelengths, then it's unstable. So it means that if I take a, a big uh, bath and I try to, ro to rotate it, then it will fall. So there is a, uh, there is a stability um, uh, critical k. And this critical k, for instance, for water is about uh, two centimeters. So be, uh, above two centimeters, I will, uh, there will be instability. Now let's shake. So when you shake, you just had a modulation of the gravity. So that's the new equation. So you have a sinusoidal modulation of the gravity. And when you solve it as a pendula, uh, as a capizza pendulum, okay, so fast motion, slow motion, you end up finding that there is a stabilizing dynamical part that is entering the dispersion relation. So now the dispersion relation is the gravity, is capillary, and in between, you have a dynamic stabilization that is here. And when you, uh, you excite this bath, then you see that all the curve is going in the positive part, or at least to, uh, for, for larger k. Uh, and you can stabilize the, the most of the, of the size. So here is what we want to do is basically, so you have a, a, a bus with a certain length. Okay, this is the biggest wavelength that you can uh, excite and you want to stabilize it. So you just calculate the critical velocity to, to stabilize it. And here you recognize the same with uh, the, the same formula as you, we saw before with uh, uh, the capita pendulum, uh, square root of GR uh, with a pi uh, that is uh, different from the two factors that we, we observe for the, uh, the capita pendulum, but L being the larger, uh, the size of your, of your, of your bath. So provided you shake enough, you stabilize enough. So, okay. so, so you can take whatever size and reverse it. So we tried to do an experiment. The first idea was we shake and we try to rotate fast the system in order to see if it was holding. Of course, it does not work. Uh, so we end up finding something uh, strange for us. So here we shake the bath, so you see the bath, and there is a bubble in the bath. And depending on the amplitude of the excitation that we change here, you can see that the bubble can sink go down or up. And so the, we were marveled by this uh, discovery, but it was discovered a long time ago, in the 60s, okay, where NASA has some problem with uh, rockets. So for the rockets, uh, in fact, they have the, the fuel of the, 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 in the tank, and they have a detector at the bottom of the tank, just saying when uh, there is no more liquid, just remove the tank. Okay, but because it's shaking a lot, <laughs> the air was going down exactly like that. And so they ejected too early uh, and they, they had their, their rocket exploded. So, <laughs> so it was discovered and, and studied uh, uh, a long time ago. But this gave us the idea to do some, uh, some interface that is uh, uh, upside down. And this is the way we choose to do. You take a syringe and you inject some air at the bottom and you shake enough so that the, 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 the bubble is, uh, it, so you, you increase the size of the bubble till it completely fills the bottom of, the, of the, the tank. So here you have a layer of liquid. It's about five to by four centimeter. And you can do two layers, by the way. So these are two layers of liquid. In fact, uh, on an air cushion, uh, just oscillating on, on an air cushion. So here you have, uh, you have produced this, uh, this air layer and they are stabilized by the mechanism I just described before, by the dynamical motion of the, of the whole system. You can do bigger, so that's about uh, uh, 
we did 20 centimeters. In fact, the, the limit is the, the limit of the shake. Uh, the price of a shaker depends on the, of the, the, the mass that you can excite, and it goes exponentially. So we are a bit limited at some point. So if you do the theory of uh, what is the critical velocity and you compare with the size that you need to stabilize, it's pretty good uh, with a very simple uh, analysis. Just to come back to this Faraday instability, uh, here uh, you realize I do not talk about the uh, Faraday instability. But normally, if I was shaking here, I, I should have uh, the Faraday instability that should appear and, 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 and be present here. Um, so here, let's, okay. So this is the Faraday instability that you, you get on both sides. Okay. If you want to avoid this instability, because here it's, it's small, but when it becomes big, you have droplets that are falling, you are raining. Uh, on the bottom, uh, you can tune the threshold by just changing the viscosity. So this liquid is pretty viscous to avoid the Faraday instability. So you just shake and stabilize. So basically for the next Olympic game, you can do swimming pools that are upside down, but uh, it, there will be, uh, it will be in, in one or something like that. Okay, next step is, um, can we do Inverted floating. So, what are the properties of this uh, upside down uh, interface? For instance, uh, does the buoyancy is working on this uh, interface? So, uh, oh, this was my dream to, to be able to, to quote uh, Jack Sparrow in a, uh, in a seminar. So, here is uh, Jack Sparrow, and we try to do uh, uh, the same experiment. Uh, so, how do we do that? Well, it's simple, you just take a, a bead and you analyze what's going on. So first, and I think it's not obvious, uh, do you have an equilibrium at the bottom? Yes, in fact, it's very, it's all, all this is symmetric. So the buoyancy is compensated, I mean, the, sorry, the, the, uh, the weight is compensated by the buoyancy, and it's, there is an equilibrium, and the same equilibrium appears uh, upside down. The difference, is that the equilibrium upside down is not stable. So you have the equilibrium uh, upside down if your bead is going a little uh, lower than it fall. If it go a little higher, then it go up to the, the top, okay? So question, does the excitation, the dynamical excitation of the whole bath stabilize this equilibrium? Okay, you do the calculation, same type of calculation that I, did, I showed you before and you end up finding this. So you, have, you can have uh, stability upside down and buoyancy is, uh, is working exactly the same upside down as it works on the, the upper part. So when we publish that, some people ask me uh, what are the, uh, the application. If you find one, I, I'll be happy. Um, so that's uh, gravity and I will finish by saying that, so that's was anti-gravity, okay? But you can do artificial gravity, and this was experiment done by uh, Benjamin Fell and uh, by Samuel Hidalgo. Uh, you can do this in any direction. So, for instance, for instance, uh, you you have a, a horizontal excitation, you have a slanted uh, interface, or you have a, a vertical uh, liquid wall that can be sustained uh, in vertical by shaking. And this was to, to finish. Uh, you can also do uh, very nice stuff. But this is an application, by the way. Surfing on the tilted ocean, so uh, you have no problem of, uh, of catching the wave. Uh, and I would like to, to thank you for your attention. Yes. <laughs>